If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Isaiah, Isaiah 17. And we're going to begin there. Isaiah 17, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Isaiah 17, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aroar are forsaken, they shall be for flocks, they shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephium. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in as the making of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in the outmost full, full fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. At that day shall a man look at his maker, and his eye shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the works of hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. In that day shall the strong cities be a forsaken bough, and an, up, and an uppermost branch shall they and the up and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, there shall be desolation. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shall thou plant, plant pleasant plants, and shall set it and shall set it with strange slips. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your precious word. We pray this morning that you would wrap it around us, that you call us to cause us to understand it. Lord, we pray for the lost, that they might see your righteousness and that you would be the answer to their needs. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, maybe some not so familiar uh, verses. If I have my Bible marked correctly, I have heard teaching on this subject, but never preaching on this subject, at least in the last 12 years, because that's how long I've owned this Bible. And uh, we read of a time that's foretelling judgment. Uh, and we read of a time, if I understand uh, verse 7 correctly, where there is no respect. Now, there was a time in uh, my life that respect was even, was even, of the, the respect of the Lord was even given by the lost man. Uh, they would not uh, blaspheme the name of God. Uh, there, there was a time when even the drunkard wouldn't approach the house of God uh, unless he was sober. Now we live in a different day where there is no respect for God's house and very little if no respect of God's people. People say about anything they want in front of anybody that they want and there's no respect for the Christian. Now that seems like a new phenomena for us but we find here in the word of God it really isn't new. It's been around for centuries. Now, because our nation was once based on Christianity, it's new to us, but it is not new to God. 
Now, you can think about your own self and uh, what do you respect? Uh, respect means to hold something in esteem. Uh, respect means that you are willing uh, uh, to, to give that person or that thing some credence. Now, you think about different, different people that's come through your life, uh, maybe some with the preaching of the Word of God and some with just knowledge, and what they see impresses you, so you respect them. I had a great deal of respect for Brother Gordon Downs uh, because of his knowledge of the Bible, and he, like me, had no biblical education except sitting under others before him. And that was a, uh, a type of respect for me. Now, in the modern day, what I have found with young preachers is they know more than the elders. You know what that is? It shows lack of respect. That's what that really is. And, and, and so we find a, a point in Israel's history where they were respecting the wrong things where they were looking uh, and giving credence to things that did not deserve them. Idols were, were very common in the days just before the attacks of the Babylonian kingdom, and they had no respect left for God. And that was their situation as Isaiah begins to name specifically uh, cities that would go down. Now, God has always been a God of particulars. That's why I believe in particular redemption or redemption to his elect is because he's never, he's never operated in a vast over sense. It's always been to specific things, specific people at specific times. He is a particular God. And so we find here that he begins to name four cities that would stand in judgment of God. Uh, their works, their attitude, their, uh, their lack of respect for the things of God brought them judgment. Now, what you see, he begins the burden of Damascus. Now, uh, I want you to see that Isaiah wasn't glad this was happening. He considered it a burden. He considered it a hardship. He considered it a, a sorrowful thing that he would be uh, having to deliver this message to Damascus. Now, Damascus was just a city in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, excuse me. It was not it was not a country. It was not a, a big place. Remember, Paul on the road to, to Damascus met Christ. And in the very same way, it was just a small city, but it would be destroyed by the hand of God. Particular judgment. Now, we like to hear about particular redemption, but when it comes to particular judgment, the waters get a little, uh, get a little salty, don't they? particular judgment, if particular redemption is real, and I believe that it is, then particular judgment has to be just as real, right? Ju ju just as genuine. And, and so he begins by naming these places that would stand in judgment of God for what they were specifically doing. The burden of Damascus, behold D Damascus, behold Damascus is taken away from being a city. Now, uh, being a governmental city uh, is still very specific today. Uh, Dover is a city. Now, with a city becomes responsibility, there's only two towns in all of Stewart County, and that's Cumberland City and Dover. Those are the two true cities that have the responsibility of governing themselves. They have their own specific town government. They have more taxes than we do, because if you have a government, believe me, believe me they're going to fund it. And, and so uh, Dover has city taxes, Cumberland City has city taxes. Those of us that live out in the country, we don't have them. But you know, there are benefits. 
the person that comes picks up my trash, I have to pay them. And Brother Eric, he sets his out there and somebody comes and get it. He told me one day, as long as it was in that basket, they had to pick it up. That's pretty nice, ain't it? Because see, if I don't put mine in a bag over at home and we pay for somebody to come get ours, they leave it sitting there. It has to be inside the bag. And so we find that this was a very organized place. They had worked to make it a township. They had worked to make it a city, and they were going to lose it all. It was going to be destroyed. There was nothing going to be left. Those of you that are lost this morning, I hate to tell you, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but one day, it, it, well, you must, if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be like Damascus. The cities, uh, the, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. Now, I don't know if this is a county. I know it's not a country. But since it said cities plural, there had to be more than one city, and it was still in this place called uh, Aurora, or Aurora. And they, they were all going to stand in judgment. Men, we need to be very careful because we're influencing people whether we want to or not. And see, with us, you're going to be held responsible either way, whether you do it or not. And what you teach them is going to be important. It has to be accurate. And so this whole group of little towns were going down. They weren't going to be anymore because of their lack of respect for the, for the things of God. They were going to be going down. And, and so we see it begins to name very specific places that had forsaken God. The cities of Aroer are forsaken. They shall be for flocks. They shall lie, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Now, I want you to see that this group of little towns were going so far that they would be back to being pasture land. That that there would be that there would be livestock living in the place where the town used to be. You know what that is? That's complete judgment. That's complete destruction. Very scary, isn't it? And uh, you know what? I, I used to think in the, you know, if that began to happen today, people would respect it. No, no. Mm -hmm. What do you think if you went to San Francisco and say this place is under judgment? There's going to be an earthquake like the 1906 one. We'll make it look like it was a, a party. How many think people would respect that? I would say near to zero. Wouldn't you? And I don't think these people had any more any, any more respect than the than that would occur today as it did then. I believe it would it would still be the same even today. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim. Now, I don't know if this was a true fortress, like a fort, like building a ring uh, uh, around the city. It could be that. But, you know, think about this, too. We have a fortress around us. You know what keeps you from the judgment of God? Christ. He's your fortress. Remember, remember the trial of Job? What, what was the devil's accusation against God? And it was there. That was set a hedge about him. And you know what? The devil was right on. There was a hedge around Job. And you know what? Praise be to God, there's a hedge around me. And if you're redeemed, there's a hedge around you. And even furthermore, uh, in the world that we live in today, there's a hedge around all of us because of the goodness of God. You know what keeps us from being just overwhelmed and taken away? It's the hand of the Almighty. He is a hedge. And so we see that this place, Ephraim had it, but they were fixing to lose it. 
Now, you can't lose your salvation, but listen, dear friend, if Job lost his head, you can lose yours too. Yeah. That's a pretty scary thought, ain't it? And, and so we see that he's giving them a warning of what's, what is to come. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus. They're going to lose their government altogether. And, and the remnant of Syria... They shall be the uh, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel and the Lord of hosts. Now you see that flip flop. The heathen are going to act like God's people, and God's people are going to act like the heathen. That sounds, does that sound familiar? What did uh, what was what was the prediction? He, uh, remember, one, one place it becomes very obvious, Paul says, I go, I go to the Gentiles. And in another place, I think Christ said, I, uh, or uh, the Lord God said in the Old Testament, I will turn my back on Israel. See, that's happening. You ever wonder why there's so few Jewish believers? It's because God didn't deal with them. Very rarely, sometimes, but very rarely. And, and so we, have, we see that one of the judgments of God and one of the destructions of Israel is that he was going to have no more, he was going to have no more communication with them. He wasn't going to teach them anymore. He, he, he wasn't going to be in their presence anymore. And Isaiah gives them that. And in that day, it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin. Now, we live in a day and age, uh, uh, and, and we'll see this bit meant nationally, but, you know, uh, everything about our culture glorifies a thin woman. Have you ever noticed that? Now, uh, that, that is... Uh, all the way back to the 1960s, really, that's, that's been the goal. But I want you to see one thing. Me and uh, a girl I work with, we've been, we've been friends since literally high school. And she's a little chubby like me. And we finally came to the conclusion the other day, we'll be in good shape if we get sick. We'll have a little something to work with. And uh, so we ain't going to worry about it no more. See, Israel had some strength. Israel had some resources. It was a fat land. It was a prosperous land. And they were about to lose it. You know, uh, when, when difficulty strikes, you need some resources. You know what I have found among God's people in the modern day is this. Some of them don't even know why they're Baptists. You know what that is? That's a thin, spindly church. Uh, they have somebody that's not teaching them. They have somebody that, that is not uh, opening this book and giving it to them. And so we find, we find the very same thing here. He warns Israel that they're going to be thin. The rest of verse 4, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax thin. Now, a lot of women obsessed with their weight. Uh, how long does it take you to lose weight? Now, a lot of people a long time, right? Uh, I, I went on one diet binge in my whole life, and it took me two years to lose about 65 pounds. That's a long time. And you look down at that scale, like, man, I ain't made no progress. All right? So this judgment of Israel wasn't like this. It didn't go by in one night. You know, you, you go by and you weigh yourself and, oh, I, I'm a pound down, but that's okay. Uh, I, I, but what happens, it's such a slow progress, and it's in the Lord's churches today that we don't even know we're losing something. And you know what? This church is the exception, not the rule. If you don't believe that, travel with me sometimes. 
And, and so we find that he gives them a very fair warning. Uh, Israel, you're losing something. You're losing your strength. You're losing your resources. And they would not listen. Verse 5, and it shall be as, and it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm. Now, can you imagine how disappointing it is to put out a corn crop and you could hold it all right here? Now, my grandmother, that's how she told me, uh, taught me when we would gather the ears, we'd pull it from the stalk and put it here like you go in wood. And, and when you got done, but see, uh, she was a very good gardener and you wouldn't get it down even a, a half row and this was full and you had to go back and put it where she told you and start it and start up when you left off. Down there at the house in the creek bottom, Charlie Hancock grows corn and he breaks. He brings it in with a harvester. I mean, a huge machine. And he cuts it off. And, and, and it uh, has the combine with it. And it throws the, the corn out. The entire... Can you imagine him putting in that effort and going down there and have three or four ears? He says, that's your warning. That's, that's who you are. And you know, we as a, we as a church... And we as families, that's what we're going to get if we don't be careful. Uh, that, that, that's going to be the occurrence if we're not faithful. And so we find that he gives them yet another warning along these lines. Verse 6, yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree Two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. Now, while it would be very bad to have an armload of corn after working all summer in the cornfield, and, and you have to live some kind of little rough to get this, it's better than nothing. <laughs> right? Now, I don't know about over in y'all side of the river, Anderson's may have it a little better than us, but the blackberries just hadn't done well here, I'd say, in five years. Just spindly little dry things. You can't even hardly make a jar of jelly out of them. Don't really know why. Uh, but, you know what? We have a little bit of jam sitting in the cupboard because we did pick up what was there. Better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Handful of us here today, well, maybe 16, 17 of us? I don't know. I never count hits. I give that up a long time ago. Uh, better than nothing, ain't it? Mm -hmm. So if this is the predictor, what do you think about them big churches today? Does that, does that coincide with Scripture? I don't think it does. I'm not jealous of them, but I'm just wondering what they're teaching and preaching to make such a bumper crop. And I'll show you in a minute exactly what, what it is when we're in this day. Verse 6, uh, excuse me, verse 7. At that day shall a man look at his maker, and his eye shall respect, have respect to the Holy One, of Israel. In that crippling day, in that day when you when you pick corn all day and come home with just an arm, in that day you will respect God. You know what a wonderful thing is, and listen, this is in good sound churches. Not every service is walking the fuse, not every service. You know, God never promised to meet with us at every service. Do you ever think about that? He did not. Read the Bible carefully. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I want you to see that that will get your dry spots get our attention, don't they? They do. Now me and me and Donna raised our garden down there in the flat on, on the creek bank. We used to do it to, to higher up the hill closer to the house. And you know why we 
quit doing it there because it was too dry. Things would just burn up. We couldn't even get tomatoes to grow. We need a resource, do we not? And when that resource is limited, we begin to respect God. We know where the water cometh. And that will give us great joy and great gladness and he'll get the honor and he'll get the glory and he'll be lifted up in that day when we see the maker for who he is. Verse 8, and he shall not look to the altars, meaning the redeemed, and he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall uh, respect that which his fingers have made. Now notice that. He finally gets the truth that it's nothing about what he has done. No respect to the things you made. Now we all have to work, right? We all have to make a living. But that should not be first. And when it becomes first, you know what? You're respecting it more than you're respecting God. Respect. Who does your respect belong to? You know what? I dare say, and hope that it's true, all my children, even my adult children today, I would to God, and I believe they do, have respect for me. And the reason why, when they were young, I taught them respect. If I said something, that's how it was. Isn't it sad today to know that the majority of the children don't have that? I really believe today, Mom said, Larry, sit down. I'd sit down. And you know why? Because I respected her. Sometimes we learn best through weapons. Sad but true, right? And therein is the respect we have for God. God knows more about what you'll do than you know yourself. Uh, I, I, I will give you that. Verse 9, and in that day shall the strong cities be as a forsaken bough, a bough with no fruit, a branch with no nothing on it, and an uppermost branch they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. Now what's the problem with the uppermost branch? My in-laws have all kinds of fruit trees over there. I don't know, I think it's an apple tree beside the garage. And my father-in-law, he'll get in there and shake it. A certain way he shakes it, and only the, the ripe come down. And uh, that's, how, that's how you do it. But you know, everyone wants, you get that stubborn apple that just won't come down. That's, that's all that's left. You know what? We need to recognize and be glorious and glorify God every time we get an apple, shouldn't we? Every time he gives us a little nugget of truth, just dig in and eat it and chew it around and taste of its goodness. Because sometimes that's all that's left. What does the Bible kind of say concerning the coming of Christ? That there would be a great, great on the way. Right? That means a small harvest. That means not much left. And so we see that Christ predicted these events even in his own ministry. Verse 10. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. When you think about the enormity of that Forgot where your salvation comes from. You ever wonder about these false denominations? And I think uh, many of them, there are no saved people in them. Uh, I'll be honest. But I think, there was this, I think I have met people that are saved and have forgotten that it's fully of God. And you know why? Because they act like, they act like they've contributed something. They act like they're strong. They, they, you know what? I am not a strong Christian. What I have, what I do, my preaching ministries is all of the mercies of God. 
And I don't care who the person is, every sound preacher will tell you the same thing. And so they had forgotten that. One of the worst things, you, you want to become an unfruitful bow, forget where you came from. Right. Forget, forget of the mercies of God. Now, very quickly, we're going to see a case in stance. He made this prediction to Israel. We know nationally Israel suffered this. They did go down. They were captives of the Babylonian ki kingdom, but it can happen to us spiritually. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26. It seems like poor old uh, Peter always gets the bad breath. But you know what? There's a little bit of Peter in every one of us. Uh, Matthew uh, 26, and we're going to begin reading in verse 31. And look at a couple of different places and we'll be done. Uh, Matthew 26, beginning in 31. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written. Now, if God says it, it's going to happen. You know, that, that seems so simplistic to us, but I think it's just as hard to believe as they did, don't you? Think about the great catching away. I don't know if I, I'll see it or not. But can you imagine? Do you really believe one moment here, the second, second there? I believe that. If the Lord's plan is to come before I, I die, I believe surely I'll be taken with that. And it'll be a miraculous thing. It'll be an amazing thing. I don't know how the catching away will be, but I do believe it's going to happen. See, when Christ says it's written, it will happen. It has to happen because he's omnipotent. He's the very God of the Bible. If he says it, it will occur. And somehow Peter got this muddled in his mind. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you unto Galilee. Now, he stated some truth to him, and he gave him some instruction. Notice Peter's response. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I shall never be offended. You know what he was doing? He's telling Christ, you're wrong. Right? It wouldn't have been easy to take. But somewhere, some way, you had to say, you're right. You're right. Now, we know that John, I think it's in the next section of the same scripture, said, Lord, is it I? I wonder what the others said in response to this statement. Peter is the only one that is recorded. But I wonder if anybody was humble enough to say, I guess I'll forsake you. It's kind of hard to take your spot when you think about that, isn't it? Hard, it's very hard to be that honest, isn't it? But it had to be so. And so we see that probably Peter wasn't much different than the rest of the clan, but he, he verbalized and said, no, no, it's not going to happen that way. And that, that was the uh, response that he said. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. We need to be prepared that we don't deny Christ, don't we? What, what does it mean to deny Christ? Now we'll see that literally Peter will say, I know not the man. That, that's a literal denial, right? But 
But how about the places we go, the things we do, the clothes that we wear? How do we deny Christ? We have to be very cautious, do we not? We have to be very... And listen, don't ever say, I'll never do that. Listen, when this flesh is, gets in control, you don't know what you'll do. That's a very hard thing, but it's true, right? And so we see that Peter makes a very bold statement. But drop down to verse 69 of this same chapter with me. Matthew uh, 26, verse 69. Now, Peter was without in the palace. Now, being without in the palace almost seems like uh, contradictory language, but what that means, he wasn't inside, he was in the courtyard. He was between the wall of the palace and the courtyard that, and the wall that surrounded the courtyard. Now, I ask you this morning, if, if you want to be, if you want to be a good witness, if you want to be faithful to God, don't spend your time in the courtyard. Just on the outside. Uh, now, I've never seen this. Uh, one thing our, our church building, when I was growing up, was like this tall off the ground. I could walk under it when I was a little boy. But I know my, my father-in-law has told me that he remembers people looking in the windows at church services. That's not a good place to be. <coughs> Not, 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 not a healthy place to, to raise your family. He's looking on the outside, looking in. It was not good. So Peter was already vulnerable, already at risk, already having some problems because he was not where Christ was. The only one we know that stood with, with Christ to the end was John. And, and so we see that he had set himself up, if you will, for what was about to occur, verse, occur, verse 70. But he, uh, uh, excuse me, but Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came and came unto him and said, That was with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And he was going, when he was going out into the porch, now, Get that. He's, the palace was here. That's where the judgment trial was happening. The courtyard's around it. And now he's out on the porch. That means he went further away from the person of Christ. That's the worst shape you, you can get in. Uh, in being away from Christ. And when you get there, move even further away from it. That, that, that is not where God's people need to be. And again, this was a saved individual. I believe Peter was saved way back in, in Matthew 16. So this was some probably years later, or at least a year later, and he's still struggling with his flesh. We shouldn't be uh, uh, surprised at that. I believe Peter had lost respect at least for the moment of Christ. I believe he'd lost respect for himself. I believe he'd lost respect for the Lord's churches, or the Lord's church at that time. And so we see his condition. And when he was going out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, Thou was there. This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, saying, I where I don't know him. I do not know the man. And after a while came unto and after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely also thou art one of them, thy speech betrayeth thee. And he began to curse and to swear. Now I want you to see. There was an element of fear that took away Peter's respect. Because notice the last time when they approached him, it was more than one. Was it some mean Jews? Well, it could have been. There was a lot of them there that night. Was it Roman soldiers? 
Well could have been. There was a lot of them there that night too. In other words, when it says them, when, and the, or they came unto him, he wasn't just dealing with a woman now. He was dealing with a group. And he had just experienced a group kidnap the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and drag him down to the temple. He was fearful. And he had lost respect. You ever meet someone that had lost respect for their self? They were so low they had not, they didn't even have recognition of anything that they had done. That's where Peter was at. Now, after this little custom fit, what happened? The cock crew. We all hear that on our places. And it was morning time. The rest of that verse was saying Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, that's a good thing. You know what? That shows repentance. If he hadn't wept, wept bitterly, I would have had concern over Peter's salvation. You see what I'm saying? But he, wept, he, he was grieved by what he did. He became a mighty leader in the Lord. But at that point, he had no respect. No respect at all. How much do you respect Christ? You ever, you ever think about that? Lost and saved alike. How much do you respect Christ? Why do we have what we have in, in 2024? I'll say this, it's lack of respect. Lack of saying, he's the very living son of God. That's respect. I will not take an oath. You know, uh, in the court system, the judicial system of the United States, they expect you to place your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing uh, but the truth. Now, I won't do that because you know what the Bible says? It's, the Bible says don't enter an oath. That, that, that is an oath when you say that. I'll say, I'll, I'll say I promise to tell the truth, and I'll do my very best to do so. But I want you to say that, for me, that's a respect thing for the Word of God. And I'm not going to be an errant to the Word of God if I possibly can. It's respect. Respect to the very living Son of God. You know why we have what we have today in the United States? I'll say this. We're on generation number five now of losing respect. Starting with our World War II veterans and going straight down the hoop to today. That's why there's very little respect over anything. Do you love the Lord? I'll tell you what, with the love of the Lord is co-joined respect for the Lord. You can't have one without the other. So I ask you this morning, where do you stand? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you respecting him with everything you got?